Okay, let's take a look at what happened in San Francisco, where under court order, uh, kids were required to continue uh, with uh, bilingual education. Sean Reardon is a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford uh, University, which has looked at them. Uh, Professor, good to have you on our show. Thanks, Warren. What are your findings? So San Francisco, as you note, has had a sort of different uh, plan for the last few years because of the court order. And they have students who are, whose parents can choose one of several different language programs for their children. They can be in an English immersion program. They can be in a bilingual program where they can be in what's called a, a dual immersion program that's actually a bilingual program that also has native English speakers in it who are trying to learn Spanish or Chinese or something. And so the district came to us and asked us to help them evaluate how well their students were doing in each of these different programs so that they could figure out what was working and where they needed to improve. And so we looked at students who entered the district in kindergarten and followed them for 10 years to sort of see how they were doing. And we compared the trajectories of those students in the different programs. And what we found was was interesting, I think. We found that by second or third grade, the students in the English immersion program uh, were, had higher rates of English proficiency and higher scores on their standardized tests. But by the time the kids got to middle school, and then started into high school, the students in the two language programs had caught up to them and in some cases surpassed them both in English proficiency and in uh, their standardized uh, state standardized tests. So the, the, the story is somewhat nuanced in that the, the short-term effects seem to favor early, uh, English immersion, but the long-term effects seem to favor the, the two language programs. Has that made you an advocate for uh, two language programs? Well, I think it's certainly... Uh, suggestive, but we don't yet know, I think, why in San Francisco we see these differences. So one hypothesis is that in the English immersion, kids are actually learning more English quickly, and so they do better on the English proficiency tests, and they can do better on the academic tests because those tests are given in English, but that the students in the two language programs are learning more academic content early on because they're getting it in a language they can understand better. And so that doesn't show up on their tests right away, but shows up later on as they become more proficient in English and then they can perform better. But we don't know. Maybe that maybe the quality of instruction is better in the bilingual programs in San Francisco, uh, or maybe there's other differences between the programs that we can't, I, I haven't yet identified. And so we're working with the district to figure out what the reasons for those differences are. You did this over 10 years. How many kids? There were about 18,000 students we followed in this study over some of them for as long as 10 years. Sean Reardon again at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. Uh, Ron Hunts, back to you, supporter of Prop 227, opponent of bilingual education. Is that a reason to give uh, other parents an opportunity to see uh, if their kids might do as well as the ones in San Francisco? Well, even under 227, students, for example, can be placed in native language instruction programs if their parents sign a waiver every year and if there's some evidence that the programs are beneficial. And in fact, a certain number of students throughout the state of California are in dual immersion programs for that reason. But the vast, vast majority of the students benefit from being taught English immediately. And that was exactly what all the journalists found when they went into the schools and checked the results of the program. Uh, Again, we're talking about something that happened 17 years ago. Yeah, but what we're hearing from uh, Professor Reardon is that, yes, there was immediate improvement uh, uh, with immersion, but then uh, the the kids in the dual language programs caught up and did better uh, in middle school and after that. Well, but that's exactly what all the professors backing bilingual education said 17 years ago. In other words, they claimed all So what's wrong with it, then, if they improve so much after uh, middle school? But it isn't true. In other words, if you look at the test scores, the academic performance improvements were dramatic in the state of California following the passage of 227. The problem is you have a situation where you're talking about test uh, studies done in small districts. And in fact, when you're talking about San Francisco, remember, the vast majority of the limited English students there are actually from Asian families. Asian households, on the other hand, have almost always had bilingual programs that were very heavily English-oriented. Quickly, uh, Sean Ridden, back to you. Uh, is that true? And, and uh, if so, uh, d- does that uh, mean anything? That's, that's not true. San Francisco, about 40% of the EL students are Latino, about 40% are Asian, and the other 20% come from about 60 different language groups. Um, the effects are most pronounced for the Latino students in uh, San Francisco. The Asian students do similar in all the programs. Um, and so I think 
one of the things you have to ask yourself is, what do we want schools to accomplish? We want, it, I think, I think Mr. Ons and Patricia and I all want the same thing. That is, we want students to graduate from high school able to speak English and function well in the United States and, and with high levels of academic skills. What my, my interest is, what's the best way to get them there? What does the evidence say gets them there the best? And so the short-term results suggest that there's differences in how fast they learn English skills, but the long-term results suggest that they're doing better over the long term if they're in the two language programs. Uh, Professor Gandara at UCLA, before we run out of time, uh, is there an economic argument uh, here? Do kids that uh, have uh, two languages do better uh, in what we all refer to as a global economy? Warren, thank you for raising that because we think this is a really huge issue. We're about to publish a book called The Bilingual Advantage in September of this year, which the Educational Testing Service, which is hardly a radical uh, group of liberals, um, actually helped us to commission a series of economic studies on this issue. What we found was that uh, what the various researchers, who were all experts in their own areas, including economists, found was that with this generation of young bilinguals going to the labor market, they earn more money than, uh, than monolinguals. Interestingly, we found that two-thirds, in a study we did here in California of about 300 companies across all different sectors of the, uh, of the labor market, two-thirds said they would prefer to hire a bilingual over a monolingual. Okay, let me go back to Ron Unz quickly. We're running short of time, but uh, how do you respond to that? Well, it's perfectly true that it's better to be bilingual than monolingual. We're talking about students who come from an immigrant background and already speak Spanish or another language. The way you make them bilingual is to have the schools teach them English as quickly as possible. So English instruction produces bilingual students, while bilingual instruction, which is native language instruction, produces monolingual native language students. Very quickly, uh, do you think, Ron Unz, uh, you were active in the Proposition 227 campaign and you won it. Uh, do you think the uh, voter population in California has changed sufficiently since then uh, that if uh, the measure were on the ballot in, uh, two, in 2016, uh, now proposed by the Senate Education Committee, it might pass? I think it would pass exactly the way it did last time. The support was overwhelming across all different ethnic and ideological groups in the national polling. Furthermore, right now the results have come in. The main argument at the time was a change like that would be disaster. Instead, it was extremely successful, and the academic performance of a million students doubled. I think stepping back and restoring the failed policies of the past, restoring bilingual education, would be an absolute educational disaster. But, Sean Reardon, you're saying it's not a failed policy. Am I correct? I don't think so. I have not seen the evidence that Mr. Unch uh, is citing on this doubling of performance, um, so I don't know about that. Um, but, but if the goal is to teach students English, by the time they finish school, there's no evidence in our study that the students in bilingual programs aren't learning English just as fast or faster um, or just as well or better as than the students in the English immersion programs. And Professor Gondara, do you think, particularly in a, uh, a very low turnout state, that the matter might go uh, the other way this next time around? So, because I think California is a very different place than it was in the 1990s when we were running a lot of very anti-immigrant and very mean-spirited uh, legislation. I, I think the state has grown up and has become very comfortable with its diversity and would like to um, really encourage that. Okay, an issue obviously that won't go away. We will talk about it uh, on future programs. And thank you all very much for being with us today. Patricia Gandara at UCLA, Ron Unz uh, with English for Children back in 1998, uh, Sean Reardon at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. Many thanks to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.